um, welcome the co-star of the film, Carrie Mulligan, <laughs> with producer <laughs> producer Amy Durning, Fred Berner, and Chris Scott McCaus McCausko Krieger. Well, um, since it's the surprise, <laughs> it's the surprise guest, we'll start with, uh, with Carrie. Um, amazing performance, as you can see, the, the reaction of the audience. I mean, most people knew Leonard Bernstein, you know, of him, and, and, and he was such a public persona. Very few people knew Felicia. So what was your first reaction when you read the script and realized that his story was being told through the lens of their marriage and their, and their, and their relationship? Yeah. Uh, oh, hello. Oh. <laughs> hello. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I knew very little about Leonard Bernstein. Um, he's not really a sort of cultural icon in the UK. As in the classical music world, of course, he is. But I think mostly everyone I knew when I said I was in a film about Leonard Bernstein said, who? <laughs> um, because it's just, you know, growing up in England. Um, but but certainly didn't know about Felicia and about her um, her story. And And when I met Bradley to talk about it, he said, this isn't going to be a film about the woman sort of standing by the great man kind of thing. That's not what I want to make. I want to make a, a story about marriage. Um, and so the, then when I read it and I could see that that was true and, and then started to learn about her, I just loved her. And can you tell us a little bit about the way you two work together? To it's it's, it's very clear that it's, it's, it's the, the relationship is very strong, and it comes across on on uh, on screen. And how much was on the page, and how much was written while you were working on it? Well, we 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 had known each other a little bit through work, just sort of bumping into each other things, and he'd come see me in plays and things. And then um, and then once I had sort of signed on. Um, he, we went to Philadelphia and narrated Candide together. Um, and so I spent a week doing that and that was quite a bonding experience because it was very nerve wracking. Um, I didn't know you could even narrate an opera. I didn't know that was a thing. So it was, um, you know, all of that was quite kind of, um, yeah, like a bit of a trial by fire in a way. And that's when I first met the Bernstein kids in Philadelphia. And um, so we had, you know, I started working on it in 2018, um, in the summer of 2018. And so we had a couple of years and then we had COVID. So we had a lot of time. And then right before we started shooting, we had a good couple of months of just being in the same city and working together. So. And how important, and this is also for you know for the producer, was to have the you know the, the, the his kids being so, such an integral part of this of this process. Uh, should I start? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. I think I had a microphone. Yes. There we go. Hello. Um, yeah, that they they as it began, so it continued, and so it has landed with the kids. Um, we call them the kids, but they're my age, which is closer to 70, so <laughs> I'm not so sure they're actually kids. But um, uh, Alex and, and, and Jamie and Nina were very supportive when I first approached them about doing a story about Lenny, and, and I think they were ready at the time. Um, it, it was one of those moments when <clears throat> I think they had been approached numerous times before. Um, I like to think that we met in a sort of a psychological place of having all done our own personal work and we're ready to confront some of the things about our past and our, and our, and our childhoods and our relationships to our parents that allowed them to um, open up their vaults and their hearts and their minds and their psyches for us to um, explore musically and in every other way. Um, so, and I, and I think that the, the good news was that as the baton got passed from 
the initial incarnation, which was developed with Martin Scorsese and then with Steven Spielberg and then ultimately with Bradley, that every step of the way, people were not only cognizant of and deferential to, but open-hearted to their participation and couldn't really do it in any other way without that. Um, I don't think you would have gotten the movie that, that has manifested uh, without their enthusiasm and honesty. I, <laughs> you guys heard what I said. <laughs> Um, yeah, they were they were everything from opening up their homes to their parents' closets to, you know, just all of the um, huge archive that is left um, behind that speaks to who they are and who their family was. And Christy, you, you work with them on West Side Story as well, right? Yes, I worked with the Bernstein kids on West Side Story. Stephen and I both did. And so I think they were also predisposed to give us some grace and and they knew that we would be it would the movie would be in good hands with all of us and i think that bradley though what he did is he said let's turn this into a love story um let's talk about lenny and felicia and let's not have it just be about leonard bernstein and that's where really when the family heard that they were like this is incredible you're gonna make a story about our mother as well as our father and I think that's where we really thought this is this is the movie that needs to be made. Uh, Carrie, how important was for you to be able to film in in the Bernstein house and to have the film so um, carefully uh, designed for accuracy? You know, we were talking upstairs about the iconography of the pictures and you know images that are known in in in, in the Bernstein canon, and and but that the film is immersed in them. There is such a such a tender care with the way this the, 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 this, the milieu has been reconstructed. Yeah, I mean, I think it would have been, I, I just can't imagine, I think it's like Fred said, you can't, I can't imagine the experience without having that kind of level of involvement and the way that, you know, we we rehearsed in their home before we shot there. So, I mean, I, I know that there were multiple scouts where people went to Fairfield and um, and Bradley and Josh wrote for that space. So they when they, when they were writing it, they were imagining and and the the you know the home has not really changed you know it feels of course the production design went in and and things were changed and moved and to make it feel like a current home as opposed to something but it really there was so much that didn't need to be changed because it was sort of preserved and the house is just full of photographs and um and we so we just had free reign to go there and spend the day there when we were in the Bradley and I did one quite intensive week of rehearsal it was just the two of us and in one of those days we went there and spent the whole day there and um just walked around every room in the house and um and they were amazing I mean, you know they were amazing they gave me her lighter she was a beautiful cigarette lighter um and it was engraved with her name on the bottom and they gave that to me before we started shooting and it's it's the lighter I use in the film um everywhere from the 60s onwards because that's when she had it um but and the the home videos the anecdotes i went to chile and met her wider family um who had their own stories and you know so it was just all completely invaluable i can't imagine how we would have done it without them how frequent is that an actor uh, gets to immerse uh, himself or herself in in, a, in in so completely in in a character's world i mean in my experience fairly rarely um because you know particularly in independent film it can be quite kind of snappy process with um not a lot of time we i really felt that we had a luxury of time on this um given that you know these guys have worked on it for <laughs> more than a decade <laughs> um but that you know even when i came on there was still um you know there was still lots of time and then it did push and so we had you know we had a lot of time um it felt probably the most kind of immersive prep period I've ever had. Um, so it was, and, and that I think meant, and, and particularly with the dialect, you know, that meant that Bradley and I had spent hours and hours and hours doing, practicing, speaking to each other, improvisation, and so that we didn't think about, you know, so that those scenes could feel really fluid and natural and that it didn't feel like it was very important to all of us, I think, that it didn't feel like a sort of period drama where people spoke in a certain way, walked in a certain way, it should feel almost contemporary, but just in that setting. So. 
Uh, there is, I think, I think um, Bradley Cooper says in a, you know, in a quote that he's never made art so fearlessly, and and there is a, a sense of fearlessness in 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 the structure of the film, in the body language of the of the character. So, can you talk a little bit about this and about him as a director? And it's for you, but also for you know, for for the for the producers. I think, Christy, you were yeah, you were joined at the hip. Yeah, um, <laughs> he was like indefatigable it was insane he came to my hotel room we were, we were both in washington dc for some reason he said in 2018 when a star is born was coming out and he had signed on to this movie at this point and he's like oh i just want to pitch you a sequence really quickly and he pitched me shot for shot the beginning of the movie not the the older lenny in the red sweater but when he gets the phone call um and he's going to make his debut at carnegie hall literally he sh he said it to me shot for shot and then this is going to happen and then he's going to get the call and he's going to open the uh, window and then he's going to run down the hallway he, it was insane and then to watch five years later us actually shooting exactly what he pitched to me was incredible because he prepped everything he just he wanted to make this movie as authentically as possible and he worked so hard like 24 7 texts at six in the morning texts at two in the morning like it was Cuckoo. Makeup at one in the makeup best way. at one in the morning. Yeah, makeup at one in the morning. He would be in the chair and he'd be like, Oh, I have an idea for this. And he just text ideas. I mean, he just never stopped. He he was it, it was um, again, it was crazy, but in the best way possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think the fearlessness comes from creating your own safety net. And if you have if you if you're deeply, deeply, deeply prepped and you know where you want to be then you can jump off the diving board and try something else. And I think that's, and that's the exuberance of who he is. And that's the experimentation of who he is. And that's a contagious energy that I think everybody felt from at any given stage. And he wound up conducting his own orchestra in that way and, and getting everybody doing what orchestra players do for their conductors that they love, which is to give their, give themselves and give the music to that particular person. So. Um, it was a wonderful synthesis yeah. with his um, content as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I I feel comfortable saying that we were all pretty inspired by Lenny. Absolutely. Throughout the whole process as well. Um, the um, uh, the music, the way the music is written into the script, is so smart uh, because it doesn't feel like the film stops. It's just like this comes from from this from the story. It's what is always like that on 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 his on his script. Yeah, um, it was. It was really part of our original concept, always that the music would be Lenny's um, entirely, um, and that in the best way uh, it would be a musical, um, and that it would speak to psychology and tone and all of those things. And I think most of the cues, uh, you know, the music has changed here and there, but many of the cues remain the same, um, even if they were edited slightly differently. Um, and that's one of the things that was always part of our original conception. Yeah, it was the, 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 um, the original pitches even to studios, we went in with playlists. So the music was there mm -hmm. in, in, the, in those conversations. So we talked, Josh Singer, who was an, an enormous researcher and music aficionado and very, very smart about the music was grasping pieces and, 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 and braiding them and marrying them to emotional psychological beats that he felt would be conducive to that particular piece of music. And it did change, as Amy said, over time. And in the editing, it may have changed a few times. But um, it was integral. And it also seemed like a really um, kind of a wonderful just dessert that uh, there would be a movie about Leonard Bernstein in which the original score would be by Leonard Bernstein. We always We always felt that was... Really important. It's important and cool and interesting and and you know he didn't have a great career in 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 I mean on the waterfront notwithstanding but you know he was a guy who felt that scoring for film the the, the object of scoring for film is to not be noticed and to be sort of in the background and he's quoted as saying when he came back from Hollywood after on the waterfront he said the idea of creating music for film where it's not noticed is kind of like not, not really for me. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of feel like we delivered the just dessert, which is, as you saw on the screens, music by Leonard Bernstein. So we feel pretty, pretty great having achieved that. 
and Molly. I'm gonna you raise your hand. I'm gonna open for a few questions to the uh, to the audience. Who has a question? There's one there. No, hold on, hold on for the mic. There's a lot of spontaneity in the dialogue here and a lot of overlapping uh, from one person to the next. And I wonder if that was scripted or was some of this spontaneously done? Um, both. Some of it was. Um, there was, there was, it was, the great thing about Bradley is that he, he sort of tries to create an environment where you don't really feel like you're on, you're being filmed. So I'd walk in, I'd sort of walk on ready and then he would start, he'd always be Lenny. So he'd be Lenny talking to the dolly group. He'd be Lenny talking to, you know, so he would be Lenny. I'd walk in, I'd find myself sort of in front of a camera and then he'd start talking and then suddenly I realized actually they were already filming and, you know, it was that kind of thing. So there was, there was, um, and there were moments that were, you know, there's the, the scene at the beginning of um, Tanglewood where we're sitting back to back and the big crane shot comes in and we're playing this game. So he said to me about five minutes before that, um, we're going to sit back to back, think of a game. And so I had this game that I used to play with my brother. It wasn't really a game. It was sort of, we sort of, when we were little, we wanted to, we wanted to believe we had a psychic connection so that I could look him in the eye and I could send him a number and he would look at me and... He'd be like, okay, and then he'd get, you know, and that was our thing, and so I, so I, that's the game that we played, and so th things like that were sort of improvised, and but there's, you know, the scene where we first meet outside the party and we're smoking, that's all written, um, but he just, it, it, he wanted that energy of I kept going faster, faster, come on, Carrie, yeah, faster, keep going faster, 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 faster. Yeah, and smoking and faster and smoking and faster. And faster. There was so much smoking. Smoking and faster. <laughs> smoking and faster. I think the gentleman here has a question. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering to what degree this reminds you or, or was inspired by, um, uh, particularly for Carrie, A Star is Born, where the character, it's, it's, it's also music um, about a musician and um, a relationship in Lady Gaga in that movie is kind of at the center of the movie. Is, is, did, did you see that movie and did, did you, what did you take from that? I did, yeah. Well, he, it hadn't come out when he um, asked me to play Felicia, and he said, um, you should watch my movie before you <laughs> say yes. Um, so I did, and I loved it, and um, and I was so excited that he was such a great director, because I already knew he was a great actor. Um, and I remember thinking that he's he's created such an incredible role for a woman, and written so well for a woman, and... Um, captured that performance so beautifully and um I think that's yeah it's, uh, and I think Josh and Bradley did that incredibly well on this the writing is so extraordinary it's the most incredible role I've had on screen in terms of the character story and um so uh, I think he was very I could see that he was someone who and he's the star of that film I mean they're both the stars of that film but he puts he sort of puts her forward to the audience in a way that I thought was really interesting Right there. First of all, thank you so much. That was chock full, amazing. Um, I don't know if I missed it, but when he was speaking about his father, um, there's a whole area there about him wanting to kill him. And I'm just curious, uh, can you speak more to that? Their relationship. I think they had a complicated relationship. <laughs> I was just looking at Fred. <laughs> yes? Haven't we all felt that way? between the potential, sorry, the potential homophobia and, and fear of being caught and anti-Semitism was just so exquisite for right now. How did you go forward with that? I would say we, I mean, we always knew that it was part of his story. Um, and in the beginning, you're always sort of figuring out what the balance is. I mean, there's so many facets to Lenny, um, which is, was part of, you know, the huge job of figuring out how to do it. Um, you know, I think in the writing of the script, again, it always came back to the story being the marriage, but giving them those 
moments where they can touch on that uh, material and touch on the conflicts he had that the marriage was a sell for in some way and also a mechanism to get through it. Um, we always knew that there was that relationship between the marriage and those other identity issues. Um, and I think, you know, to me, it was just the real rigorousness of Bradley and Josh sort of staying on story, but being able to find those moments that it was very much part of who they all were dealing with those things. It, it would have been very tempting, and it was early in the development, to hit on some of these, you know, there was, there was the uh, House on American Activities, there was about, it, there were numbers of things Tom that Wolf. we could have, mm -hmm. Tom Wolf. There were there were numbers of things where we could have really um, drilled down into those specific things. And I think the genius of where the screenplay landed, if I do say so myself with Bradley and Josh, is you could allude to those things by refracting it through the relationship. So they're in the movie without becoming the focal points of the movie. And, and I think that subtlety is something I'd like to spread around the world <laughs> right, right now um, and still have the conversation. So I appreciate the question. Thank you. And I, and I think it speaks to what uh, uh, Carrie was saying before about the film being faithful, you know, to, to its period, but be feeling so modern, you know, so vital yeah. to, to what's happening today. Uh, where's the other one? There. Oh. Um, much ado was made about the makeup ahead of time and particularly the nose. And I, I actually found it all incredibly convincing and I was looking for reasons to be distracted by it, but I'm just curious, <laughs> you know, how, how you approached it. Cause it's the kind of thing that if you get it wrong, it can go horribly wrong. Um, again, it's like working hard as hard as you can for authenticity, authenticity, authenticity. So Bradley will tell you he moved into Kazu Hiro's house for a little bit. He didn't actually move in, but he was the at Kazu who um, did the prosthetic makeup for Bradley. He was at his house, and they just worked on honing the makeup and figuring out the right balance for his face at every stage of makeup. There were five different stages of makeup. The young makeup took two and a half hours to do, and the older makeup took five and a half hours to do, and everything else in between. And so you don't go in a makeup chair thinking, you know, I'm I, I'm setting out to look like somebody who has a Jewish looking nose, right? Like that just doesn't, that's just, it doesn't make any sense. So anyway, um, they worked for three years, three and a half years. We had a year because of COVID, the movie was put behind. So they were able to refine the makeup and they just worked and worked. And then I think the gratifying piece is when they would FaceTime the Bernstein kids and the Bernstein kids would look at Bradley with the makeup on and go, Oh my God, that's our father. <laughs> um, you sort of knew that you were going to the right place. It's amazing. And I think the other thing too, Kazu always talks about, you know, so much of what he does with the makeup is about performance. It's about finding that line where, you know, the Bernstein look and Bradley's performance and, uh, you know, emotion can come through. And, you know, that was a really stunning process to watch them just make mistakes and fix it and years and years and years of going back and back and back until they got it right. And they worked on it throughout the entire film, like refining it while we were making the movie. It was quite extraordinary. And you would also watch Kazu with little little binoculars in the corner while Bradley and Carrie were acting to just make sure that the makeup wasn't falling off of his face. But he would be like in the corner with these little eyeglasses. It was insane to watch him do what he does. His craft is so incredible. And Sean Griggs did uh, Carrie's makeup. And um, when, you know, as Carrie's dying and that is incredible makeup. And she had prosthetics for part of the movie as well. So there was a giant hair makeup job for this movie <laughs> for decades. Just, I just, uh, I'm, I'm curious to know what Bradley's uh, uh, experience with music is, because as much as it's a story of a marriage, I think the Ménage à Trois is not so much uh, uh, Lenny's uh, other uh, interests amorously. It's really music. And uh, 
and uh, the musical part of the film rings very true. And I know uh, uh, how far back in his childhood we see conversant with music and uh, uh, because that's really a heavy lift to pull that off. I mean, it's quite amazing. Uh, Shall I talk about Radley's music? Yeah. yeah, why don't you? Bradley asked Santa Claus for a baton when he was eight. Uh-huh. <laughs> and to conduct Tom and Jerry cartoons. To conduct Tom and Jerry. <laughs> and then that one also was pretty pretty stellar at air guitar from a similar age. So Star is Born and, and this movie were kind of both, he'd been practicing almost his whole life <laughs> for both of them. And, and but for Star is Born had like, you know, endless singing lessons and guitar lessons and became essentially, you know, a musician that played Glastonbury. I mean, he really did play Glastonbury. Um, and for this, he he went to the same lengths and was... He spent time with the New York Philharmonic. He went with Gustavo Dudamel to the, yeah, the Berlin Harmoniker. Is that what it's called, yeah. that group? And, yeah. and went through the entire Mahler second like from, you know, the entire thing with him. Um, and he worked with Michael Tilson Thomas a little bit and all the conductors at the New York Phil, the guest conductors, he would sit up in a corner and just watch and listen and, you know, learn everything that he could. All, all the time. Like Immersive, you'd be on the phone to him. Like, he'd be, first of all, he'd be FaceTiming as Lenny, like ye- three years yeah. before oh, with yeah. his latest version of Lenny. In the and voice. In the voice. Um, fake cigarette, not smoking, but smoking. And then he would be like, oh, I'm just going to the New York Phil tonight to watch. So it was just, it became a kind of practice him. for him. Mm-hmm. And I think he was, there was a, an early, he talks about a playlist growing up, which was heavy in classical music with his yeah. parents. So just, it's, it was in him. It was, it was, it was being played on the records in the house, which I think gets to, gets to your, your innards. I think we have a question there, Mira. Well, two of the things it's, oh, thank you. It's impossible not to come back to about this wonderful film are the freedom of the structure, which is just thrilling, and the generosity of the work between you and Bradley, Kerry. And um, I know a little bit about his his background, and I I am just curious. He also, at a screening that I attended, spoke about your joining him sometimes just, you know, on the spur of the moment and getting involved. To what extent were you able both to work sometimes outside of the script and also when you were in the script, were there ever times where you would try to work in continuity specifically for purposes? Because the the performances are so lived in and the structure is so free and undidactic, it's really magic. So just if you could shed a little light on that, that would be wonderful. Thank you, first of all. That's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of it was, um, well, I found the freedom. I felt like I was on stage for a lot of it because he didn't, there's not a lot of coverage. So there are so many bits where, you know, the Thanksgiving Day scene is just one single locked off camera for the whole thing. Kevin Thompson, our production designer, had recreated the Dakota apartment um, 360. So we walked into that room. There was one camera. They locked it off. So there was one other person basically watching. Everyone else was in another room. And we just did the whole scene three times. That was the third take. And then we stopped. Um, so there were so many days like that where we just, you know, we had that freedom. I love it when the camera's way over there. <laughs> and I don't have to think about it. Um, and there was that happened a lot. And there was, and then, like I said, there were these situations. There was a big party scene in the Dakota. Uh, uh, Steve Morrow, our amazing sound and um designer mixer Mixer. I never know um he basically allowed it us to to shoot that whole party scene at the same time so whilst there's a room full of 50 60 people there's parties going on Lenny's in one room with Shirley I'm in the other room with Mendy and Cynthia we're both talking at exactly the same time doing our scenes and then we would cut and Bradley would come in and go how was it and I'd be like I think it was all right do it again and you know so it was that kind of freedom that it did I think 
he, he wanted to make it so that it felt like a playground. And um, and I remember every time an actor would come in, because it was me and Lenny a lot, but when it wasn't, someone would come in and they'd say, how is it? And I'd say, oh, it's so fun. I mean, you'll never know what's going to happen, but it's great. And it was like that kind of every day. As a follow-up question, uh, one of the themes that I found very moving about the film is the dichotomy between the inner creative life of, of, of an artist and the performative aspect. And, uh, you know, and it, and it just carries through through the film. And I wonder if, as, as, as an actress, is that is that a theme? Is that a, something that reverberates with you? Because I really f find the film pulsating with it and, and the character. Yeah, it's interesting. We One of the most probably the most helpful um, part of our um, preparation and research was these incredible tapes that John Gruen um, made. And um, when he went to interview and spend the summer with the family in Anstedonia, and he was making a book called The Private World of Leonard Bernstein with these incredible photographs of them and their family. And in that, he interviewed Lenny and the family and Shirley and Felicia. And there's about two sort of 40-minute sections of Felicia. And he... At this point, she's married, she's got three children, you know, she's largely kind of given acting a long break. And he, at one point, is urging her to return to acting. And he says, um, you know, you're so, you, you were great, you should just do it again. And Jamie would love it, the kids would love it, you should definitely give acting another go. You never gave yourself a chance. And she says, oh, I never gave myself a chance. I was always half in, half out. And there was something about that admission. And then she goes on to talk about how much she couldn't stand the actor's studio and she found it embarrassing. And she was much more, uh, she was much more fond of the sort of European way of acting and that she found the actor's studio this sort of ridiculous, like people lying on the floor pretending to be animals and she just thought it was stupid. And um, But there was a part of me when I heard that that thought, you don't think it's stupid. You just wish that you could let yourself go to get down on the floor and be an animal. Like... Because I recognize that in myself. And I didn't go to drama school because I didn't get in. Um, and I remember thinking, the first time I did a play in London when I was 18 at the Royal Court Theatre, I heard all the actors up in the, I could hear on the tannoy the actors warming up and they were making these crazy noises. And I was like, what? Um, I'm not doing that. And I was so afraid of of that thing. And I and I remember when I read, well, anyway, long story short, when I heard that Felicia say that, I thought, oh, oh I've been half in, half out. I've been half in, in. And it really, and when I joined on this project, Bradley said, if you're going to do this, you have to really commit, go all in. And in my head, I thought like, not all in, but okay. Um, but I said yes. And then, and then actually, the more I learned about Felicia, the more I was like, oh, okay, I will go sort of all in and not be embarrassed and try and like be an animal on the floor. And, and so I did, and I'm, I'm so glad. And, and, and it kind of re it sort of made me think a lot more about how I'll work going forward. Uh, uh, they're motioning me for time. So we have time for one more and uh, it's going to be here. Well, first a uh, uh, deeply regarded and profound congratulations. It's, it's a remarkable thing. And uh, I commend also all the departments. You've been speaking about makeup and wardrobe and Kevin and the set decoration. The visual is incredible. And there are two very distinctive things. One is that it's framed in 4-3, and the other is that it begins with a long black and white and becomes color. And I'm wondering if uh, you could tell me where the gestation of those decisions was. Bradley. <laughs> it was all Bradley. It was his decision from the beginning. Um, yeah, he always knew what he was going to do. He wanted to show the movie sort of how we view life in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Everything was black and white, so you, you kind of see the world in black and white when you reflect on it. And then in the 70s, it goes to color. And so that's all. it was always what he was doing. He was always doing that transition on Felicia's back in the party. There was always a time jump there. Um, it was just always what he was going to do. He really pays attention to all that. He worked with Maddie Libatique, uh for a long time ahead of time, and they worked on A Star Is Born together beautifully. And so it it just was all from his mind. Especially going to color at Tanglewood, having started in black and white, I found it. I was in tears actually. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the things he, that he talked about was that that. Um, in Lenny and Felicia's lives together, the frame is is foreshortened. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And once Lenny is alone in the world, he goes to a, to a, mm -hmm. to 185, which is a, a format in which you can be in the center of the frame, but you can be quite lonely in that center of the frame. Mm -hmm. So there was always reasons. There were always artistic reasons for why he was doing what he was doing. And um, thanks for noticing. Yeah. And Star is Born, he said, was side by side. And this movie was coming and going. You're either coming into frame or going out of frame. You're either very close in your relationship and you're close on them, or you're very far away and you're watching like a voyeur and you feel the distance in the relationship. I'm really sorry, but we have another show, so we have to stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>